Hey, hey, it's Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we connect you to ranchers and beef industry enthusiasts who can help you build a more profitable operation and improve your lifestyle. Are you looking for a community of ranchers who support and challenge you to be more profitable and proactive? Then sign up for our monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Minds are mastermind events for ranchers to come together once a month and find solutions for their own and the industry's challenges. Stay connected by following Cattle Convos on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and never miss an episode or event update by signing up for our newsletter on casualcattleconversations.com slash newsletter. If you get value out of this episode or any episode, drop a comment or tip me by using the link in the show notes. With that, let's see who our guest is today and connect you to a new resource to improve your own operation and lifestyle. All right. Well, thank you for hopping on the show today. I'm excited to have you on here. But to get started, would you share your role in the beef industry so that my listeners can better understand what you do? Yes, uh, I'm Carl Hoppy. I'm an extension livestock specialist located here at the Carrington Research Extension Center, which is a part of North Dakota State University. I work for NDSU Extension. I'm a beef cattle specialist, like I just said, but I, I work my expertise is nutrition and management, both in cow calf and feedlot for our uh, North Dakota uh, clientele. Well, awesome. So you've got um, a lot you're kind of doing there. So what is kind of your background or why are you interested in kind of beef cattle nutrition and the feedstuff side of things? Well, I always sum this up by saying uh, my dad was a cattle feeder. My grandfather was a cattle feeder. My other grandfather was a cattle feeder. So I grew up in the industry as uh, as a corn farmer and and cattle feeder coming out of Iowa. I, I got my degrees at South Dakota State University both one in reproductive management, uh, re- reproductive physiology for my master's, my PhD, I decided uh, cattle eat every day. They breed once a year, but they eat every day. So nutrition is where I want to focus on. That's where most of our expenses are in a cow herd. And that's where we need to feed cattle correctly. And that's why I've been focused on the nutrition side. When I finished my doctorate, I wanted to get involved in the extension work consulting, extension, production management, really production type agriculture. And uh, the opportunity here at Carrington, North Dakota came uh, came about and uh, I've enjoyed the position ever since. Well, that's exciting. So with your knowledge, I mean, I'd really like to talk to you about alternative feedstuff options. So many areas were obviously faced with drought this past summer. And while that's already happened, it's not gonna be the last drought we face. So when producers see that we're going to have a drought year, what are those first steps they need to take when looking for alternative feed resources? The first thing you need to consider is whether you're going to replace feed or supplement feed. So you need to decide if it's going to be a major feed source for the cow herd or if it's going to be in addition to whatever feed resources you already raise on your farm or ranch or have access around your farm or ranch. So we need to know what your your base feed program is. So in other words, if we normally put up corn silage, we'd be looking for a little extra protein. If we normally put up hay, we'd be looking for some extra protein. If we're normally putting up wheat straw, we'd be looking for energy and protein. Um, I usually, the word protein shows up, but for the most part, we're always lacking in energy content in our feeds. And so when we start looking for co-products, the real issue is what's located nearby. So our freight costs are low and if it's competitively priced. Sometimes these co-products are high priced more than what other things are. And other times they're extremely reasonably priced and uh, you can afford the transportation, get it to home to your place. I bring that up because some of those are like beet pulp. If, so if you're in the Red River Valley, beet pulp is uh, um, a nice replacement for corn silage if you adjust for the moisture content. A lot of our corn silage is 65% moisture. A lot of the beet pulp is 80% moisture. So you do the math, you have to adjust, but the crude protein is about the same. Energy content is about the same. 
The downside, though, is when you're shipping a 30-ton semi-load of feed pulp someplace and it's 80% water, that means you get six ton of dry feed. How far can you haul six ton of dry feed before um, freight costs make it prohibitive? In other words, you can buy corn locally cheaper than what you could haul in this byproduct from. Uh, previous years, it'd be like 100 miles away from the plants. This year, with double the feed prices as normal, um, maybe we can go 150, 200 miles. Now the problem is the demand. There's a lot of demand for it, so the availability is tight. Now we got to look at other things like uh, wheat middlings or soy hulls, or or the favorite one can be distillers grains. Okay, so you mentioned some alternatives there, but so we're everything you just mentioned, would you say those are all alternatives for protein or what would be other supplements for those producers who are feeding silage on a normal year? Well, if we look for, um, silage is gonna be a little bit short of protein. Questionably, depending upon what type of calves you're, if you're feeding calves or cows or lactating cows, as you increase the production demands, you're gonna to have to increase the protein content of the ration as well. So, um, Things we might use with corn silage would be uh, the cheapest one out there or most reasonably priced is going to be distillage grains, whether it be wet, modified, or dry. Uh, they're all priced accordingly to whatever the dry feed, whatever the dry value is. And um, that's usually, quite frankly, you get the energy for, for whatever the corn price is and the protein comes along uh, basically at no additional costs. So you get about 30% crude protein or ration, uh, which means you could provide um, four to six pounds of dried distillage grains to provide a pound of crude protein. Well, otherwise you'd have to feed two pounds of soybean meal or two pounds of canola meal. I'm kind of going in different directions here because there's so many options you can use to uh, supplement a corn silage hay-based ration that it just comes down to availability and then price. And right now, price-wise per pound of nutrient, uh, if you're gonna do it for energy or for corn, the cheapest one is usually distillage grains. So I think that's a great point that, you know, there's a lot of different avenues you could take and it does come down to availability and price. So then looking at that, what resources or where should producers go to really make sure they're finding the best option to feed their cattle if they're looking for alternative feedstuffs? Well, I've been putting together a price sheet with phone numbers and co-products available in North Dakota for the past 20 years. And I share that with our county extension staff, our county extension agents, and every county in North Dakota has one. So the first thing I do is encourage the producer to go to the county extension office and ask for this uh, uh, list of co-products available in North Dakota. Then at that point, you start looking at what's local and making a few phone calls and find out what the most current price is or what type of price they have for you. And then once you've done that and know what your prices are, now you got to do the quick math, which is uh, knowing the price of the, of the feed stuff. And then you need to know the percent protein of the feed stuff or the energy content of the feed stuff and do the math so you end up with a cost per pound of energy. And be sure to include freight rates in the that calculation. And now you figure out which is the cheapest one to haul home, the most reasonable priced one. So the next consideration is storability. And some of these feedstuffs you can store for a long period of time. Others have a little bit of moisture and they don't store very well. Others have some uh, uh, higher levels of fat content. So while they're good, uh, and fat is extra energy in the ration, they'll tend to bridge up or cake up and now it becomes a real challenge getting that out of uh, some type of storage. I always smile because uh, when I go onto some farms and know if they're using dried distillers grains, I usually look for the sledgehammer that's located at the bottom of the grain bin because they've had to pound it and beat on it in order to try to get the grain bin empty. So some of these things, it's easier just to put it on flat storage and uh, scoop it up, cover with plastic or whatever, and scoop it up that way and put it in your mixer wagon. So let's talk about options for maybe producers who aren't feeding that TMR. What about the producers who are mostly just bale grazing, putting hay out for those cows? What would be some of those options that they could potentially look into if their normal hay crop wasn't there? 
Self-feeding proteins is always a challenge. It usually comes at an extra cost. Some of these proteins like lick tubs or liquid supplements that cattle can lick on a wheel that they're self-fed, regulating intake is a real challenge. Um, I, I'll pick on lick tubs for just a second. I can because I use them. So I, I, I um, consumption needs to be watched and they usually eat about eight ounces per per day, which is a half a pound. And do your math accordingly and you find out that they're usually formulated for that type of uh, consumption. However, if you take a 30% crude protein lick tub and they're eating a half, half a pound of lick a day, 30% uh, of a half a pound is about, oh, um, doing the math in my head, about two ounces of protein. They need a couple of pounds of protein a day, not two ounces of protein a day. So if you're short on protein in the ration, thanks for the Band-Aid, but you didn't solve the problem. You need to provide more. So how do we do that? Alfalfa hay is a nice thing to go out and shred and provide, the, or provide that to the cows, or they do have alfalfa pellets, depending upon where you're at. Or you can provide a cake and I use that term as a large diameter pellet that's 20, 30% protein, which is similar to lick tub, except when you go out and feed the cake, you don't feed just a half a pound. You go out and feed four to five, three, four, five, six pounds, even up to 10 pounds, depending upon how much is needed. So that's one way to add some extra protein by going that way. Um, that's a cell feeder. The next thing is if you've got a small cow herd, you can go out and bucket feed. Tame down your cows, get them used to uh, feeding out of a feed bunk requires a little bit of exercise and energy in your behalf, but you can do that. I've seen other places where they've got uh, um, motorized dispensers in the back of their uh, ranger or four-wheeler, and they can just go out, click on the switch and unload it into a feed bunk that way. Again, that could be a uh, ground feed or a pelleted feed or a cake. I just like to make a point though, is sometimes when we wanna go supplement on these like bale grazing cattle, um, we want to feed out in the ground. Uh, I seen some data that talked about using distillers grains as a dried product, putting it on the ground and maybe only half of that being available actually to the animal because it disappears into the ground. I mean, it's unless you're going to have your cattle lick the dirt off the ground and then go into the ground licking dirt, it's really hard to um, have them consume that or get what you have them consume what you delivered. So the next challenge is to put out feed bunks for them or something so they're not eating off the ground. Now things like cakes, large diameter pellets are made to be fed on the ground. So, you know, they come at a cost. Well, I think that's an excellent point and something that producers are always trying to be aware of is, you know, maximizing the feed they have. Because like you said in the beginning, it is one of the biggest expenses to any herd. So you've really talked about different options for feedstuffs, things to be aware of when you're changing the diet, but what mindset do producers need to have when they go into trying to change their diets or looking for alternative feed source? What's the mindset they need to have? Well, the, one of the, actually the very first thing they need to do is do an inventory of how much feed they have and then try to estimate how long that's gonna last for them based on how they've been feeding. Then the next thing to do is to do a feed test on your different feeds to find out what you actually have. Um, I was pleasantly surprised by a group of feed stuffs that a producer shared with me the other day. And basically what everyone to feed was good because they're high in energy, high in protein. I wanted to give them a award for the good quality of putting up feed for him during a drought. I was really surprised. And then I heard out he was uh, blending that in with some low quality stover and forages and I got a little bit more disappointed then because now you need to be very careful on how you're gonna mix the bad stuff in with the good stuff. He had some good stuff. Good feed is what, I, is what I'm saying by good stuff. He had good feeds. And if that's all you had to feed to the cows, you wouldn't have to worry about supplementation. But he was blending that with the poor, with the poor quality feeds and uh, making a ration. So now the next question is, now we gotta add whatever's lacking. So if we don't have seven, eight, nine percent crude protein in a uh, gestating cow's ration, we need to add extra protein. If our energy content isn't high enough, we need to add extra energy. Now I could list off things like TDN values and NEG values needed for a cow herd. But quite frankly, you need to look at your cows and look at what we call body condition scores. Or if you don't like that term, look and see how fat the cows are. 
If you can see backbones on your cows, they are deficient in energy. Don't try to kid yourself that they are all thrifty. Um, they're in good rig. They're um, looking pretty good. Uh, no, if you can see the sharpness of the spine over their back, those cows are underfed. They need more energy in the ration. And you just usually can't pick that up in a month. It might take two months or three months of feeding extra energy. It's a lot easier to take the fat off of a cow's back than it is to feed the muscles and the fat back onto the cow. So that's a slippery slope. You need to watch what the condition is. You, you, everybody that has cow herds have been feeding cows last year and the year before. And I find out they tend to do the same thing next year as they did last year. So um, if your cows are thin, we need to address how to get more rash, more feed into the cows. Uh, maybe it's the drought year and you just have poor quality feed. Again, then it means supplementation. Great. Supplementation, you usually always need a little protein. You actually need a little bit of energy. So with those, uh, wheat mids, soy hulls, corn gluten feed, distillage grains, um, even beet pulp or beet tailings, uh, there's a, a lot of feeds that you can buy for protein as well as holding energy as well. Now, there are some pure protein feeds available in North Dakota, like soybean meal, canola meal, sunflower meal, linseed meal, and those can be fed. Um, they just don't carry as much energy as those other co-products that I've been talking about, uh, mostly because they are protein sources. And if they do carry the energy, then the, the the price of those protein sources are actually quite a bit higher because of the high protein source, because of the high con oh, protein content. So it's kind of a challenge when you start mixing these things together, what you need. It comes back to ration balancing. So I'll just put in a plug for extension. If you don't have an idea of how to do ration balancing, uh, contact your local county extension agent or your specialist or uh, reach out to your feed company and put faith in that salesman or representative or nutritionist that they are in looking out for your best interests and have product availability available for you. Actually, these commercial manufacturers, they provide a good service for us because there's things like minerals, um, ionophores, extra things we can add into the ration that you don't get with co-products. And so if you buy, and I, quite frankly, they buy the co-products, mix additives with them, whether it be minerals or supplements or extra protein or whatever, and then they formulate a product that works quite well with the feeds that you have. It comes at a cost because they got to make money off the feed too. So a lot of times when I talk about co-products, we're taking out the middleman and just going directly to the cow's mouth from the factory that produced the, the co-product. But those are not balanced rations usually. You need to look closely at what you have and balance the ration. So um, while I usually talk about protein and energy, the addition of vitamins and minerals is definitely something that needs to be considered as well. Well, thank you for going into more depth on that. And I mean, you brought up a lot of different options. You went through whether they were more protein or energy sources and offered um, resources for where producers can go to get more help. So kind of switching gears a little bit, from your side, from your role, you see a lot of different producers and, you know, people feed differently. So you see a lot of different operations and how they're going about feeding their cattle. Mm -hmm. If you could change one thing about how most producers feed their cattle, what would that be? Oh, I think we've already done it over the years. We've gone to totally mixed rations. The TMRs, the vertical mixers, grinding hay and mixing silage. And all, so we've created a balanced ration for everybody. And uh, it works really well. Uh, you know where your feed delivery is. You know what the weights are of the feed that you delivered. You can monitor how the cows are doing based off of how much feed is delivered to your cows. Uh, you know, that type of technology really works well. The downside is it costs money to buy a mixer wagon. It costs money to have another tractor running. It costs fuel to run those things, and it takes time to use them. But if you're short on feed, a total extraction works really well. You don't see the dairy cow industry uh, having an a la carte, here, go eat a round bill, eat some hay, go out and graze, we're gonna milk you. Uh, you might do that and you'd get a quart of milk, but if we feed them the way they need to, we get, you know, 100 weights of milk out of a cow in a couple of days. So it's, you know, production takes good nutrition is the answer. So now 
you look at that thing and you go, we're up in Canada during the BSE problems many years ago, and they had cow herds that they couldn't slaughter, nor could they afford to feed. So they had to think of different ways to feed their cow herds so they could be cheaper. And that deserves a lot of discussion and consideration. And that means uh, we've opened up the issue for cover crops, grazing feeds in the wintertime without harvesting feeds, somehow trying to feed a cow herd without using equipment to feed the cow herd. Um, that doesn't come without challenges because, you know, the cow, you, you got to provide a good ration to her and work accordingly. So you got to be a good stock person to make that whole thing work, but it certainly can. And then you got to have, if you're going to graze throughout the winter time, you need to have um, a plan B. In other words, when you have six feet of snow and everything out there that they're supposed to graze through is covered, you need to have a feed resource and the opportunity or availability to actually feed them something different or however long it might take. Might be a couple of days, might be a couple of months. We just never know how severe. Now, a way to get around that is to swath graze or put the hay into swaths, swaths, and then let the cattle go out and graze the swaths, which means they're usually, cows can be, they'll figure it out. They'll bust through the snow layer and eventually find that windrow of hay and then they'll start eating through that. Of course, if you're a January calver, that may not be a good deal. But if you're calving in April and May, you've definitely got some uh, effort the cow can work on in the winter time trying to rustle up some feed. Some cows figure it out, other cows may not. And maybe those other cows need to go to a different home if that's your situation that you're working on with a cow herd. Awesome. Well, thank you for all of that today. You've really hit on all the questions and topics I wanted to ask you about, but do you have anything else you would like to add or share with the audience today? Well, you know, um, I had some uh, young gentlemen working with me yesterday and we discussed uh, different types of sheep. And a lot of times when you're looking at animals uh, in, the, in the show world, they like to have them trim and thin and not much belly to them. And I was trying to uh, make the comment that if you look at a lot of our purebred breeders in the beef cattle industry right now, they look for depth of body, really deep ribbed animals, animals that have a lot of capacity to eat forages. That's what we need to look at in our industry, animals that have capacity to eat all types of forages, because that's what our cows are. They're really based on forage consumption. So look at the design of your cattle. And if they can't consume enough forage, uh, you need to look at a different design. That's my thoughts for today when it comes to, you know, something different than feeding. Look for cow type and, and intake. And, you know, sometimes we think that really tight gutted animal looks really good looking and athletic and great, but, you know, you need to have some guts to them in order to eat a lot of feed. So that would be my, my parting comment, if you would. <laughs> I think that is an outstanding parting comment, and thank you again for being on the show to get today. If my if anyone listening to this has questions, is there a way they could potentially contact you, a specific email, or would you prefer they go to their normal extension agent? Well, it's always good to go to your frontline county extension agent and discuss with them because we do put I put on trainings with the county extension agents, and uh, they're always available. Um, I'm here at the Carrington Research Extension Center, part at North Dakota State University, so they can always call our Carrington Research Extension Center. Um, emails, I get a lot of them, so uh, I would prefer that you call the main office and have it routed to me, uh, the call or whatever, and uh, we can converse then. Um, or we can send an email, it's just sometimes they get lost because of the sheer volume of, of emails a person gets. Well, awesome. Thank you again, Carl. Oh, anytime.